you know, our, our twin pillars are theological faithfulness and courageous love. We found that the church typically has a theological position. Sometimes they're very passionate about it, but sometimes they don't always embody God's kindness in terms of uh, caring for people who are wrestling with their sexuality or yeah. gender identities. Welcome to another episode of Sex Plus Christian Parents Podcast. I'm Jason. And I'm Thomas. And we're going to spend some time on this episode looking at some of the foundational approaches around the LGBTQ conversation. And specifically, we've brought in Dr. Preston Sprinkle. He has written many books on these conversations, uh, starting with People to be Loved, Living in a Gray World, and most uh, recently, a book called Embodied. He is also the co-creator of Christian Sexuality, something that we worked on together. And what we recognized is a little while back, we invited Greg Coles to join us. And we so loved the conversation that he brought, but we also recognized there was a lot of story. And so for this episode, we wanted to bring some of the foundational conversation, the needs, the the theological betting of of some of the conversations around LGBT. And I I need to say this too. We've gotten a lot of questions since Greg's episode. So this is the first of what we hope a few other episodes that will really help lay a theological framework for the conversations around LGBT. And so that's why we're so thankful for Preston to be with us on this episode. I, mean, I think there's a lot of confusion over these terms, what they mean, what they don't mean, you know, um, the acronym, I think people see it all the time now, but I don't know if they would be able to really break down the different nuances of LGBTQ plus. What's the plus there for? What are we talking about? Preston will now lay out the basics of the acronym LGBTQ plus. L lesbian. Um, you are attracted to the same sex, not the opposite sex. Um, lesbian is only used for females. Then the G, gay, same thing, attracted to the same sex, not the opposite sex. Typically, well, in the past, it was more reserved for male same-sex attraction. Uh, But today, both men and women would refer to themselves as gay, but only females would say lesbian. Um, Bisexuality um, doesn't mean that you need two partners at the same time. It just means that you will experience some level of sexual attraction to both uh, sexes. Transgender, gosh, how do I summarize this in a quick, I mean, transgender can mean so many different things to so many different people. On one end of the spectrum of transgender identities could be somebody who simply doesn't resonate with gender stereotypes. You're a female who likes sports and doesn't cry during chick flicks. I've got friends who might identify as trans simply because they don't fit the stereotypical way in which males or females should act. On the other side of the the spectrum of trans identities, both using the same identity, might be somebody who believes, even if they're a biological male, like I've got a friend who's biologically male, and yet believes he is a woman, not wants to be a woman, not feels like a woman, but he says, I am a woman, based on his internal sense of who he is, you know. Um, So those are two very different uses of transgender. And then there's, I mean, that's a spectrum. So there's all kinds of different um, ways in which people can use trans. So that, the, the T really does um, add some beautiful uh, complexity to this whole conversation. So you, we cannot simply correlate LGBT with being gay. Gay is one identity, one experience within the LGBT acronym, but it's not, we can't just use gay and LGBT as a synonym. These are very, you know, the LGB and the T are very different. Q, many younger people uh, identify as queer, um, which I don't know about you, Jason, but you know, we used to play smear the queer in (laughs) elementary school. (laughs) (laughs) And, And that was very politically incorrect, but it was a derogatory term that it was people like me used to do, you know, say towards gay people. But, um, but now it's been sort of reclaimed by younger people um, as an identity. Queer can apply to various things. It just means different. Right. So it could apply to somebody who feels um, it could, it could apply to the T experience or the LGB LGB experience. Um, it's kind of a catch all term. Um, plus, I, you know, I, I personally don't think the plus is, 
that helpful. I do use it sometimes, but plus might include asexual people, people who are, don't have any sexual desire, um, intersex people, people who are born with some atypical features in their sexual anatomy. It's more bio, a biological thing, um, which has nothing necessarily to do with their sexuality. I mean, it could, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. So, and then there's all, you know, there's two spirited and non-binary and many other identities that get, um, uh, you know, that, that are sort of wrapped up in, in the plus. So, uh, but L- LGBTQ is kind of the standard acronym. There is a lot to take in. I, I, I don't know about you, Thomas, but in the conversation with Preston, I, I know that what we recognized is just the many complexities that come with each letter and the need to really not only understand, but have uh, a desire to even go further, under, understand, but also know. And so that way we can, we can engage with compassion and with knowledge. And parents, it's fair to recognize that you may get overwhelmed in trying to learn uh, the various nuances and aspects within that acronym. That's okay. That's a normal yeah. feeling. But it's important that you press in. Oh, and I think that so often with something we don't know, instead of pressing in, we, we, we run away. Absolutely. And we we are fearful, and I and I also just think that um, we we in these conversations have got to become more comfortable in the things that make us uncomfortable, and that's why I just really appreciate Preston and his uh, pressing us on. One thing that I think too uh, is really important is just the dynamic of stereotypes. You know, Preston brings that up briefly, but there is something in stereotypes that we have to pay attention to because I think that sometimes our stereotypes can reinforce things that really are not biblical. And we do that in the church. We do that in our own homes. I know that I'm guilty of that. And so I'm always conscious of the fact that like stereotypes, you know, there are things that are cultural and there are things that we, we, we might see that are in the Bible, but you know, David is a great example because, you know, David played a harp and he cried and he also slung a giant with a stone, right? <laughs> right like, right. I mean, it's masculine and feminine. And I just think paying attention to that is really important. Uh, and that's why I'm so grateful for Preston because he acknowledges these things and, and he also acknowledges as a parent, as someone that's engaging in this, how overwhelming this conversation can be. And this is where Preston is going to give parents some advice on how to navigate that feeling. Uh, Give yourself a break. I mean, if you're, I would say encourage you to begin the educational journey and really get to know these terms, just, just so you're able to communicate and understand the world your, your kids are growing up in. Cause this, this is the world they're growing up in. You could be mowing it. You can protest it. You can disagree with it, but it is what it is. It's kind of like people who, you know, bemoan the internet or social media. It's like, yes, yes, yes. Get it, get it all out of your system. It's not real relationships. It's pro- okay. You got it out of your system. Okay. That's the world we live in. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So we got to, we got to learn how to be disciples of Jesus in it. And then the same thing with all these different identities and everything. It's just the world our teenagers are growing up in is confusing or, uh, you know, as much as you want to disagree with some of the concepts, that's fine, but you still got to understand it. There is a lot of baggage that often comes with these words. Uh, Sometimes we don't understand them. Sometimes we use them, and yet we're so unsure what uh, they mean or if it's okay to use them. Uh, You know, words like gay, same-sex attraction, or SSA, uh, homosexuality or homosexual, there's so many different words that we can find ourselves tripping up on, and we can believe they're loaded, and they may or may not be loaded, not have the meaning that we often think they do. The term gay can be really confusing or or misunderstood. Lots of people, when they hear the term gay, they have all kinds of assumptions of what that means. For some people, when they hear gay, like if someone said, I'm gay, the assumption is that, well, they're having lots of gay sex, like they're actually acting on this attraction. Sure, maybe some gay people are having gay sex. Um, some straight people are having straight sex. Um, guess what? Some straight people are not sexually active and some gay people are not sexually active. Some straight people yeah. don't believe it's okay to have 
sex outside of marriage. And some gay people believe the same thing. So the term gay simply means same sex attraction, unless somebody else, you know, is, is, is using it in a more, um, maybe multi-layered way. Um, yeah, homosexual, it is a, it is an older term. And I know, uh, older gay people sometimes even prefer the term homosexual, almost every younger person by younger, let's just say under 30 or under 40. Um, they don't prefer the term homosexual. It's, you know, one of my gay friends said, it's kind of like walking into an IT department and asking about floppy disks. You know, it's like, well, that is the right term floppy disk. And they, I guess they are a thing, but people are going to rate, going to raise an eyebrow. Like where have you been the last 20 years? You know, um, same thing. If you start using the term homosexual, younger people will immediately, most of them will immediately kind of make a judgment call on your awareness of, kind of what's going on in our world. So um, I, I like to say, let's, let's use terms and, you know, words in a way that build relational bridges rather than relational walls. And if you go around using the term homosexual, you're going to unintentionally, I'm not saying there's anything, you're not, no, no ill will on your part, but you will unintentionally be building these in, almost invisible relational walls with younger people um, because it will, make it seem like you haven't really paid attention to kind of the broader cultural conversation. So yeah, most people prefer the term gay, some more conservative Christians who experience an attraction to the same sex might not like the term gay. They might say, well, I I wrestle with same sex attraction, but I'm not gay. Mm -hmm. Meaning this doesn't define kind of the essence of who I am. Um, So there is, again, there's that debate between whether same sex attraction or gay is is a better term. Now you've noticed in the episode thus far, we've really just been laying the groundwork for the language in this conversation. What we want to do is demonstrate this posture of listening and learning. We're not asking you to change biblical convictions or your biblical foundation. What we're doing is we're saying, can you just dive into the conversation and understand what's being said? And I love the way that Preston actually dives into the experience of being gay because I know that for some of our listeners, these topics thus far might seem a little bit elementary if you've engaged in the conversations around sex and sexuality for any period of time. But I also know there are a lot of listeners that have not engaged in these conversations, and that's why we're doing this episode. And so the next part, I think, is just as important because Preston dives into the question of whether or not being gay is something that is chosen. Same-sex attraction, I guess the number one thing I would want parents to know is that well, any kind of sexual attraction isn't, isn't something you choose. For 99.99% of the people, they, they don't choose who they're going to be attracted to. It just sort of comes upon us, if you will. And then there's different theories of what might lead somebody to be attracted to the same sex instead of the opposite sex. And we can get into the whole nature nurture thing, but for for kids that experience same sex attraction, they usually around puberty, sometimes before puberty, they'll experience it. In almost every case, it's, it's unwanted, which which again, kind of supports the, the truth that it's not chosen. If it's unwanted, it wouldn't be chosen, right? According to one study, you know, 96% of kids when they first experience an attraction to the same sex, the very first response is to pray that God or a God or the divine or some higher power would take it away, whether they're religious or not. They don't want this um, because they feel different. They don't, they feel atypical or abnormal. Um, Typically same sex attraction comes with a lot of internalized shame. It just piles up as they're wrestling with by themselves. Uh, or, you know, but yeah, without anybody else to wrestle with. Um, And so by the time, you know, a kid, a teenager might come out to their parents or even their friends, they they may have been wrestling with this for years and and have all kinds of anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts built up. And so um, oftentimes when we see somebody come out, you know, whether it's a son, daughter, friend or whatever, it's kind of the tip of an iceberg of, of a long journey of really intense wrestling with who they are and who God is and and what why is this happening to them one other question that may seem elementary is the question around nature versus nurture 
okay, so nature, nurture. Nature is people are born with this attraction. Nurture is something happened in their upbringing that caused them to be same sex attracted. Let me say this as a preface. Theologically, biblically, either nature or nurture are both allowed within a theological frame, a Christian biblical theological framework. Don't think that out of a theological pre-commitment, it needs to be one or the other. Because I think that's where some conservative Christians, mainly in the past, in the 80s and 90s, thought if it's nature, well, they would say it can't be nature because of theology. And then they go look at the kind of evidence. Well, if you already assume that you can't believe it's nature, then you're obviously not going to look at the evidence fairly. Theologically, people could be born with same-sex attraction because we're born with all kinds of desires that may or may not align with God's will. Like theologically, that's right at home with a Christian theology of human nature, Ephesians 2, uh, Jeremiah 17, if you need some verses and many others. Um, or it could be nature. We, we know that um, things could happen in your life that could nudge you toward certain behaviors, you know? So, so either nature and nurture are totally within or they're allowed. Okay. So deep breath, we're off the hook. Now we can just look at the evidence, the scientific evidence. We don't have theological pre-commitments that force us to do one or the other. What does the science say? Well, virtually any scientist that has really looked at the psychology, the even the, the chemistry, the genetics, the, the, the sociology of, of this whole conversation, virtually every psychologist or, or scientist is going to say, you know what? It's a blend of nature and nurture and nature and nurture are so interactive with each other that it's impossible to unravel. There's stuff that happens when you're six months old that it's just, we don't consciously even see it, but it's just, it's just, it's, it's so complex. The line between nature and nurture is so blurry. So even the American Psychological Association, no friend of conservatives, is going to say, you know what? There's there's no evidence for 100% nature, 100% nurture. Most people say it's a blend of both. And Mark Yarhouse, probably the most well-known evangelical Christian psychologist, is going to say the same thing. Uh, liberals are going to say the same thing. Conservatives are going to say the same thing. People that just look at the evidence are going to say it's a complex blend. So um, sexual abuse, that was a big one in the past, that you know all gay people are gay because they were sexually abused. Well, the... The percentage of sexual abuse is, is much higher among gay people, uh, 30 to 40 percent, according to most studies. Um, it's, I would say even more so with, with, uh, uh, with females, the, the sexual abuse, especially if it's, uh, you know, as most cases by a male, a male abuser, um, that oftentimes does have an have a effect on your sexuality. But is it? Can we simply draw a straight line between sexual abuse and same-sex sexuality? Well, well, no, because even if it's thirty or forty percent, that means more than half who are gay weren't sexually abused. But it, it's not like a one-to-one. -one, like every any person who's abused will end up being gay. Parenting could play a role. Um, I do know several, you know, gay people, uh, males who they didn't have that kind of fatherly. Um, affection, you know, or whatever that maybe they had a domineering mother, but guess what? I know loads of straight people who had distant fathers and domineering mothers and they're still straight. So again, this is where it just gets really kind of complicated. Um, and also, you know, just because something might be more nurture still doesn't mean it's a choice. This is where some people, they think nature, nurture and nurture means it's choice. Well, that's not, I mean, think about language. Like Jason, you and I were, we weren't born speaking English right? It's not in our genetics. And yet we never chose to speak English. It's not like we woke up one day and said Chinese, Spanish, or English. I'm going to choose English. And yet, so it's purely nurture, unchosen, and we can never not speak English. Like we can not speak English for 60 years and it's, we'll still understand. Like it's just so embedded into our humanity that it feels like it's biological almost, and yet it's 100% nurture. So again, the nature nurture is so complex and it's not really let me just end here i mean theologically it's not that crucial to figure out whether it's nature or nurture but pastorally it's important to know again coming back to my original point that people don't choose these attractions whether it's cultivated through their upbringing or maybe there's some biological 
propensity here. Either way, it certainly feels like God made me this way. God made me gay and then told me not to act on it. What does this mean for my faith? That is the question every single Christian teenager who is experiencing same-sex attraction is asked. They're not asking a sexuality question as much as they're asking a faith question. So that's where I think parents need to really dig into. This is extremely important. I love that Preston points out they're asking a faith question. This is an opportunity for you to dive in with your kids surrounding your faith on a very important topic. Have they been created more sinful by God? This is a valid question. And instead of pushing them away or rebuking them or however we respond, maybe we're terrified as parents, right? Instead of doing all of that, we can engage them with Scripture, with the hope that Jesus brings us, and help them realize they are still fearfully and wonderfully made by God. And Thomas, this is exactly where uh, Preston is about to take this conversation with regards to sin, because one of the things that we often get asked a lot on the podcast is the question around same-sex attraction, and is it sin? And I know that sometimes we want to put things in a box, ask simple questions. I don't know if it's that simple, but I, I really appreciate the way Preston presses in to that question. Um, I don't think it's a morally culpable sin to simply experience an attraction to the same sex. I do believe lust is a sin, whatever whatever form it takes. Uh, sexual behavior outside marriage is a sin, but I don't think simply being attracted to the same sex is a sin. It might be a temptation to sin, um, but it's not a sin in and of itself. And maybe we, we might need to d- dig into that a bit more. But I think those are th- those are good categories to understand if you're a parent trying to just, you know, uh, begin to engage this conversation. I think understanding the basic idea of what same-sex attraction is, is super important. So Thomas, we come back to something that we had on Greg's episode was the conversation around same-sex attraction and is it sin? You and I had a brief exchange of words around this. Yeah, I want to know quickly what your thoughts are as as you've pondered that and now you're hearing Preston uh, state that it's not a morally culpable sin. Yeah, that, man, I, I appreciate Preston. And I remember when Greg said this and we were working through it and I was still working through it. And some of that I had to admit wasn't even necessarily from a theological framework that I've developed from scripture, but probably what's been passed down to me throughout being taught in church. And, and I want to make a strong distinction there. Because just because we teach something doesn't always mean it's truly represented in Scripture. And so I always want Scripture to be the authority. Um, the more I read Scripture, I, yeah, I think I'm going to end up there that, that I don't know if that attraction in and of itself is sin. Yeah, I, 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 and I appreciate the way that you say that, because I, let me just turn to Romans 1. I, I, Do I don't like to just turn to one passage that engages this. Yeah. Listeners, please understand, there are so many passages. I'm choosing this one because I, I, it's, it's, it's fuel for the conversation that Thomas and I are having here, and I think it'll help uh, expand the conversation that Preston's having. But it says in Romans 1, starting in verse 26, because of this, God gave them over to the shameful lusts, even their women exchange natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. Let me just pause there for a moment because it does not say anything other than lust. It does not say they're shameful attractions, right? It says lust. And I'm sure if we were to take time, dive into uh, the Greek that is here, it would point to what is um, in the mind, what is you might be able to press into desire. Again, attraction, desire, these are two words that we're, we would have to interplay with. But specifically, the attraction in and of itself, as I read it here, that's not the sin. It's what you do with your brain or, more specifically, what you do with the behavior. I mean, would you press into that? Would you agree with that? Would you disagree with that? How would you engage that as a pastor? Yeah, I I would, especially when you're seeing that word used, and once again, not going into the Greek, although I did pull mine up because I am curious um, as I'm reading. (laughs) Of course you did. Of course I did. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I just, even even as you translate that, you probably could go with a translation that said, um, like, natural intercourse for unnatural, because it's very specific, and this is just a... Which is physical. Which, that's what I'm going to get to, right? It's very specific. This is the physical act. Not what they're attracted to, 
not what you find appealing, but physically, and you can go later on with Jesus, of emotionally what you do with that, right? right. If you're lusting over it, desiring it in such a way, or acting on it, right? That that seems to be the heart of what Romans is getting at right here. Yeah, I, I and I think that that for our for if you're listening to this for our listeners, one of the things that I just wanted to point out is I, I take us here because I do believe. This will come up in other episodes. This is something that we really want to, to dive into. We're trying to build a theological framework, not just in one aspect of sex and sexuality, but in all aspects. And so we've got to spend some time diving into these conversations. And, and so um, we, we recognize the importance of this. I appreciate your perspective, Thomas, uh, a, a, as a pastor and I hope that what you hear us engaging and what you hear Preston engaging will be helpful as you engage this with your children in your home. Preston does something as well in this conversation around marriage, because marriage is going to come up a lot in these conversations, because what is marriage is probably one of the most crucial questions as we are diving into the LGBTQ plus conversation. And Preston does a really great job with this. Wrestle with this question. Do you believe that acting on your sexual desire is necessary for human flourishing? And before you say, well, no, you know, it's like, well, wait a minute. But do we, do we give the impression that, for instance, marriage, because we, as Christians, we believe sex belongs in marriage. Are we training our kids just to simply, you know, I wish I had a towel, you know, grin and bear it and get through your singleness and just somehow, just somehow say no to your sexual desires and then just get through this miserable single stage and then God's going to bless you with a spouse. Maybe you don't say that explicitly. Most Christian environments I've been in send that signal loud and clear that marriage is the assumption of what's going it, to, it's sort of built into the script of faithful Christianity. You know, you grow up in a Christian home, you go to Awana, you learn the verses, then you hit puberty and all right, hold on, just hang on. By, you know, 23, 25, you'll be married. And if you're 30 years old and attractive, physically attractive by American standards and still single, people think something's wrong with you. Wow, look at her. She's so pretty. How come she's not married yet? As if something went wrong. We, we, we live by the idea that because we need to have sex, it's just life's going to be miserable for not having sex. And because, unfortunately, we believe it has to happen within marriage, we just just wait for that day, you know. And I don't know, I don't know how parents are you know receiving this right now, but I, I that that's the brand of Christianity I grew up in. It's what you grew up in, right, Jason? I mean, it's what we all kind of more or less. But that says something about what we believe about acting on your sexual desire. So if you have, if you unintentionally assume and reflect and, and embody that kind of narrative, then what happens when your kid ends up same-sex attracted? If acting on your sexual desires in a consensual, loving relationship is necessary for human flourishing, then you have unintentionally given him the idea that's not in the Bible that he has every right to pursue a same-sex sexual partner. Maybe wait until marriage, that's fine. Gay marriage is legal now. Um, but that's that's a warped view of marriage. It's a warped view of human flourishing. It's a warped view of sex. So I, th I think we need to get back to fundamental questions like, I mean, it's, it's fascinating how biblically oriented people like myself, like you, have gone so long in evangelicalism and have never been challenged to wrestle with the question, what is marriage for? <laughs> Parents, there it is again, marriage. It's coming up again. In fact, if you can remember episode 10, and if you haven't heard that episode, go back and listen to it with Cutter and how we spoke about marriage and the idol we often make it. We cannot simplify marriage in a way that it's going to solve all the problems. That's not true. So what we want to do is actually be able to have a complex conversation with our kids, especially those who have questions about their faith in terms of their sexuality, about the design of marriage, God's plan and intent, but also God's plan and intent for people who choose singleness. 
We have to recognize this is a conversation that continues over time, not just takes place in one moment. And, and if you say, well, it's when two people fall in love and they commit to each other for life and it, produce, it solves loneliness and makes you happy, everything there is secular and not biblical. Um, uh, it's, it's just, we, I think we've adopted a very secular view of marriage and sexual expression and added one footnote, wait until you get married, but everything else we've kind of basically absorbed. And, and I think that's, that's problematic for how we end up approaching or don't know how to approach the LGBT conversation. So I think God created us as sexual beings, clearly sex, God does. I mean, I don't know how explicit you're allowed to get here, God designed the intricacies of sexual desire and sexual pleasure and sexual behavior. He designed that before the fall. (laughs) The first command is be fruitful, multiply, have lots of sex. So sex is a beautiful thing. It's from God. It's a good thing. Um, And yet he gave us guidelines on what it looks like for image bearers to flourish as sexual beings. So I think we need this starting we need to start from the perspective of sex is good. And yet these guidelines that sometimes can be challenging uh, can Mm. seem like they're trying to steal our joy away. These guidelines are actually intended for our human flourishing. Even if we don't um, understand that because of, uh, I'll just say the new Testament and Jesus, (laughs) we know that marriage is not essential for human flourishing and that singleness is, is a beautiful thing. You can flourish as a single sexual being without erasing your sexuality. Look, I'll be honest, some of the answers to these questions we're asking, they're not simple. I mean, they're, I think for evangelical Protestants, we're so used to kind of like, this is going to sound, I'm trying to think of a better way to say this. We're kind of used to chapter and verse theology. Now, like, what's wrong with that? Well, it, we're kind of looking for like, thou shalt not, thou shalt. Marriage is for, you know, and, and the Bible just doesn't, it gives us kind of the patterns and rhythms and themes of scripture. And I think we're, we're more reliant upon a, a more holistic view of scripture to an, even answer that question. What is marriage for? That's such a great question. And unfortunately, our time is up on this episode. <laughs> but the great thing is, is we're continuing this conversation because I believe that question is the very question we need to be asking at the beginning of each episode that we have here over the next few episodes. What is marriage for? Such a great question. And we have got some great guests and some great experts that will be able to dive into that. But for now, we're so grateful that you have spent this time with us on this episode for this episode of Sex Plus Christian Parents podcast. I'm Jason. And I'm Thomas. Thank you so much for listening. And be sure to look at our library of resources at project619.org. Thanks for listening.